So we left off on Wednesday with Dunn. I gave him a little bit of background. Um, so rather than start with writing something on board, let's just start with the poem. On 704-705, excuse me, valediction forbidding morning, if you're using the 10th edition, uh, page 882. <clears throat> I mentioned, you know, um, Dunn, when Dunn died in 1631, by the end of that century and until the early 20th century, he was primarily known for being a sermon writer and deliverer. And people read his sermons um, apparently fairly widely. Um, and when he was delivering those sermons in the 16, late teens and throughout the 1620s, he would pack St. Paul's Cathedral. The St. Paul's Cathedral that I'm talking about is not the one that you see today if you go to London. If you walk across the Millennium Bridge, you've got, if you're facing St. Paul's, Shakespeare's Globe is right over to the right, a couple hundred yards. And you go across the Millennium Bridge in a uh, half mile, maybe, from the end of the bridge is St. Paul's Cathedral. Big, huge dome. That's not the St. Paul's. St. Paul's Cathedral that Dunn preached at, worked at, etc., was entirely made of wood. And it was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1666 in London. Most of London was destroyed in that fire, okay? Um, so Dunn was known primarily as a sermon writer. T.S. Eliot revived Dunn's reputation in the early 20th century when he wrote an essay about what are called the metaphysical, metaphysical poets, okay? Dunn is kind of the founder of the group of um, school of metaphysical poetry. Metaphysical is a term that Dunn never used. It's a term that gets applied to him by John Dryden, if I remember correctly. And Dryden uses it derogatorily. He says that Dunn, how does he put it? Um, something to the effect of Dunn troubles women's minds with metaphysical issues. And what he means, and he's being sexist. Okay, I'll just throw that out there. Dryden's being sexist and saying, you know, women shouldn't be thinking of the kinds of issues that Dunn is raising. Issues of being, of why are we here, et cetera, et cetera. Another poet refers to Dunn and uses this same term and creates this term, metaphysical conceit, okay? A conceit is an idea. So a metaphysical conceit is a metaphysical idea. And what that's getting at is a comparison of two very dissimilar things. Two things that you normally would not think to compare at all, right? One of the greatest examples in Dunn's poetry, trying to see if we have it in here, and we don't, and I don't think it's in your book. Um, just one second. I think I would assign it if it were. Nope. It's Dunn's poem, The Flea. Okay? Probably the greatest example of a metaphysical conceit. Because Dunn compares <coughs> a flea, a blood sucking, biting parasite, right? With love. With love, with sex, possibly with sex leading to pregnancy, etc. Most people would go, ew, absolutely disgusting. Why would you do that? 
All right? Look up the poem. You can find it on the internet very, very easily. So in this poem, A Valediction for Bidding Morning, we get a whole bunch. We get several different metaphysical conceits. That is, these comparisons. Now, a little bit of background. I don't remember if your book says anything. No, it doesn't. This poem is dated 1611. We don't know that that's when it was written. It's dated 1611 because Dunn's first biographer, a guy named Isaac Walton, who also wrote a book about fishing, uh, who was a friend of Dunn's, who knew Dunn, quite a bit younger than Dunn, he said that Dunn wrote this poem when he had to go, had to leave England and go to the continent. Part of his job, he was a secretary to a man named Sir Robert Drury, very powerful man. Secretary means he handled all of his correspondence, wrote all of his letters for him, received his letters, answered, all that kind of stuff, all right? In that Dunn's wife was pregnant at the time when he had to leave. And she had a premonition that something bad was going to happen while he was away. Okay? When Dunn was away on this trip, his wife delivered a stillborn child. Okay? So the poem, according to Walton, is the speaker is Dunn. The person being addressed is his wife, Anne. One, do we have time for this? Yeah. One little background thing about Dunn. My dissertation was on Dunn, so I was spending a couple more minutes on it. Dunn was 26, 28, 26 or 28, something like that. In 1601, so he was born in 1572, so that's 29. Was it 1501? And I think 15, around 1599, 1600, Dunn married a young girl named Ann Moore. Okay? <clears throat> they met around 1598. Dunn was 26 when they met. Now, if I remember right, Ann Moore was 14. Okay. Um, they married three years later, I think it was. She was 17, and he was 29. All right. They married secretly. A little bit of background. She was the niece of a man um, named Sir Thomas Edgerton who was the keeper of the seal. That is, the seal that King James, at this point, Queen Elizabeth, that Queen Elizabeth would affix to all official royal national documents. Like a, a parliament passed a law that she approved, the royal seal gets affixed to that. He was the keeper of that. He held it. Really, really powerful job, okay? She's his niece. Dunn is working for him at that point as his secretary. He's already been a member of parliament, so he's, he's on a pretty high upward trajectory in terms of political society. He meets her there. They fall in love. Again, he's like 12 years older than she is, 11 or 12 years if I remember correctly. And they secretly get married. Her father doesn't know. Okay. Her father is also important. Uh, his name is Sir, I'm going to say Thomas, not the Thomas More who becomes a Catholic saint, different one. Um, the secret gets revealed somehow. And a bunch of things happen immediately. One, Thomas Edgerton fires him. So they're married. He's now fired. Two, her father, Sir Thomas More, has him thrown in prison because he married his daughter without his knowledge, against his will, all that kind of stuff. 
and Dunn spends, if I remember right, something like three to four months in prison. Um, letters back and forth between John Dunn and Thomas Moore survive. They're at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. There's about 20 of them, all right? From that point on, when he gets out of prison, he is essentially unemployed and unemployable. I mean, talk about your canceling. He was canceled at that point. So all he does during those years is he writes poetry for people. Somebody has a birthday coming up, he writes a poem. Somebody dies, he writes a poem commemorate the per commemorating the person's life. Eventually, Robert Drury hires him to be his secretary. One of the reasons he doesn't get a job is in 1603, when James VI of Scotland becomes James I of England, James puts it in his mind, he wants to have John Donne as his personal royal priest. John Donne is not a priest at this point. His family and her family, entirely Catholic. He had a brother, my mind might be a little fuzzy on this, pretty sure he had a brother, Brother put in prison for being a priest. He had an uncle executed for being a, being a priest. Not for doing, just for being a priest in England. That was capital offense under Elizabeth towards the end of her reign, okay? Dunn, seemingly from the late 1590s to about 1611, was on this spiritual journey, leaving Catholicism and becoming Anglican. Right? By 1615, he becomes Anglican. 1615, he becomes an Anglican priest. All right? He does a lot of sermons for St. St. James. For King James, he becomes Dean of St. Paul's, etc. Okay? His wife was about 17 when they got married. Um, by the time she dies in 1617. So they're married for about 17 years. By the time she dies, she has 12 children. If I remember right, four of them don't survive out of infancy. Um, none of Dunn's family survives after, if I remember correctly, 1700. I know there are no Dunn survivors today. There are no members directly related to John Donne alive today. Just like there are no members, there's nobody alive today who can trace their ancestry to Shakespeare. It's like they put all their genes into their writing, into their literary output kind of a thing, okay? So, this is a valediction for bidding mourning. What's a valediction? Why do all of you, you know, graduated high school, and if you were like my kids' high school classes, you probably had anywhere between five and 25 valedictorians. Utterly ridiculous. One of my kids, I, I'm not kidding, there were like 22, and they all spoke at that graduation ceremony. A valedictorian is supposed to be the top student, the number one. Well, schools don't want to single out the number one when you have a bunch of students who have greater than 4.0 GPAs. How you can have greater than 4.0 is beyond me, but anyways. So what does a valedictorian do? What did, maybe you only had one. What did the valedictorian in your high school class do in his or her speech? They said it's a farewell. Vale means goodbye, diction, speech. It's a goodbye speech, okay? So this is a goodbye speech, colon. Dunn wrote three valedictions, okay? Three saying farewells to. This one is a valediction forbidding mourning, forbidding sorrowing. What's the cause? The speaker is leaving, okay? So... The poem begins with a simile. As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes now, and some say, no. So, so the second half of the simile is in the second stanza. So, 
Let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempest move. Twere profanation of our joys to tell the laity our loo. Go back to the first stanza. How do virtuous men or people die? Silently. Silently. You don't know when they die. That is, you could be sitting there on the deathbed, as the stanza tells us, and going, is he dead? Is he still alive? Hold the mirror up to the mouth. Is there any breath? What's the implication? They don't die how? Kicking and screaming and saying, oh yeah, God, you know. So let us melt. Let us melt. Like what? Like virtuous men do. Not literally melting, because what happens, you have to assume a spiritual tradition, you have to assume a Christian tradition. What happens when a person dies? The soul departs the body. That is, there is a melting, a dissolving of the person from the body. So let us melt. Let us separate. And make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempests move. The tear floods, the sigh tempests, those are what are called Petrarchan conventions. These were mentioned in the introductory material about poetry. Petrarch was an Italian poet who created the sonnet form, and he created all these images to describe love and the effects of love, both the positive effects when one is in love and it's good, and the negative effects when one is in love and one gets dumped or one's love is not requited. So tear floods, the floods that are caused by an enormous number of tears or amount of tears, it's not literal. It's an exaggeration that I'm crying so much, I've created floods that wash away, you know, the produce and animals and all that kind of stuff. And my sighs become like hurricanes that destroy the world, okay? So, let us melt and make no noise. Shh, shh, quit your crying. Don't cry. Don't sigh. Why? Because if you do those things, to a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our loop. And there's kind of the first metaphysical conceit. The speaker is equating himself or the speaker and the beloved with a certain class of individuals and equating everybody, not the speaker, who might be hearing these sighs and cries and seeing these tears with another class of individuals. What are the two classes? The people out there, the laity. Anybody know what laity means? Or what it is in reference to? If this were church, and I'm standing up here talking, what does that make me? More than likely. Preacher, priest, you know, pastor, etc. Those of you out there in the pews slash seats are the laity. The preacher, the priest, etc., is someone who has been ordained, someone who has, you know, gone through training, had hands, special initiation rites, etc., etc. The people out there haven't had that experience, all right? So, it would profane our joys. That's what profanation of our joys means. So to make something profane is to do what to it? Downtown, pretty sure it's still there, there's an old church building that's no longer a church building. I think it's a bank now. Anybody know what has to be done to a church building? before it can be turned into a bank. It has to be desanctified. That is, the body that owns the church, let's say it's Methodist or something, they have to come in and kind of remove, <laughs> through prayers, the sanctification of that space. Because that space had been, quote unquote, 
made holy for the use of God, to worship God, etc. Well, you don't worship God when you're sitting there counting out money. Well, you might. That might be your God. Okay? So he says it would make our joys, which are somehow holy, profane. It would dirty them. It would lessen them. To do what? To tell the people out there about our love. In other words, our love is holy. It's secret. There are only two initiates into this love. The speaker and the person being addressed. Then he gives us another image. Another conceit. Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. But trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. Greek astronomer, mathematician, etc., named Ptolemy, came up with an understanding of how the universe was um, composed. Okay? It's called the Ptolemaic conception of the universe. That conception says Earth is at the center. We call that geocentric. Okay? And it is surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spheres. So think of the Earth as a ball. Around that is a concentric ball, another one. Around that is another one. Around that, each one out larger and larger and larger. Each of these spheres moves. Out here is what's called the Empyrean. This is where God dwells. And according to Aristotle, God doesn't move. God is totally stationary. But God makes everything else that moves. So God makes this sphere move. When this sphere moves, go in a pool, a round pool is where this works best, and start moving the water right at the edge of the pool. Like with a skimmer, like you're rowing. What happens eventually? The farther in and into the center of the pool, all that starts to move. This movement makes this move. This movement makes this move. This movement makes this move. But it's this movement, this movement, and this movement that is making this on end. What's this the basis of? Today, you can pick up a copy of the newspaper, Tennessee and Daily News Journal. They both have them. Your horoscope, because it's based on astrology. If you're born under Venus, that means you're a lover. If you're born under Mars, that means you're a warrior. If you're born under pick your planet slash star, that says something else about your character. That's the this is the basis for that kind of belief system. So Movement of the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. What, what's meant by movement of the earth? There was one just a couple months ago in Turkey and Syria. Earthquake. Okay? You have them every now and then in Tennessee, but they're little mild ones. Until the new Madrid fault rips again along the Mississippi, when that sucker rips, we're going to feel it. And it'll be big, okay? I'm from California. I'm used to earthquakes. I've been in 6.2, 6.3, enough to probably knock you out of those chairs, depending upon the kind of quake, all right? And how long it is. Been in many of them. Movement of the earth, it still does this today. I don't mean earthquakes. Brings harms and fears, and men reckon what it did and meant. After a big earthquake, like an eight or a nine, or even a seven, you can get on the Drudge Report, and there will be a link somewhere to an article about where's God? Why does God allow this kind of thing to happen? That's exactly what the speaker is getting at. They wonder, why did this happen? 
Is this an example of the end times? Because Jesus said there will be earthquakes and wars and, you know. So, moving of the earth brings harms and fears. And people wonder, what happened and what does it mean? But trepidation of the spheres, trepidation, fear of the spheres, that's these spheres, in their movement, though greater far, that is, the movement of the spheres is much, much greater than an earthquake. Is innocent. Trepidation of the spheres is innocent. Why? The date of the poem, 1611. We're pretty sure we can say, not only based on Isaac Walton, but on something else in what's called intellectual history. Something else has happened, okay? That enables them to say, this, the movement of these spheres, totally irrelevant to us. Why? This is the Ptolemaic conception of the universe. The Copernican conception of the universe is what? You have the sun and around the sun revolve Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, etc. And they do what? All of those together revolve around something else. It's no longer geocentric. At the very least, it's heliocentric. That's, down, that's Copernicus. Okay? Copernicus comes up with this in the mid-1550s, if I remember correctly. Galileo proves in 1610 the Copernican theory is not theory. It's fact. In other words, this, this is a false image. It's not true. And if it's false and not true, then there is no movement of the spheres. And this is a bunch of hooey. Astrology is not science. Astrology is just make-believe. Okay? That's why trepidation, fear of the movement of the stars and planets is innocent. They can't hurt you. Dull sublunary lovers love whose soul is sense cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it. So, here's the earth, here's the orbit of the moon. Everything beneath the moon and the earth is called sublunary. And in the Ptolemaic conception of the universe, what that means is everything down here is changeable, mutable, impermanent. Nothing down here lasts. As Heraclitus, famous Greek philosopher, put it, all is in flux. Change is the one constant to life. Okay. Dull sublunary lovers, that is, lovers whose love only exists in this realm, here, whose soul is sense, the essence of their love is, what's he mean by sense? Sensory perception. You see someone? You hear someone, you smell someone, you taste someone, you touch someone, okay? Their love, because it's based on sensory perception, cannot admit absence. Why not? Well, if I'm here and my wife's here and we have a dull sublunary love and she goes out that door I can no longer do what? Put my arm around her. She's gone. The thing that elemented it, that made up that love, her physical being is gone. OK? 
Okay? So why is that love sublunary? It's mutable. She's gone. I'll find somebody else. It cannot admit absence. Why? Because it, absence, doth remove those things which elemented it. What are those things? They're going to be alert, alluded to in the next stanza. But we, notice, we, <coughs> we aren't dull sublunary lovers. We, by love so much refined, it goes higher and higher and higher than this. That ourselves know not what it is. What's the correct answer? To those of you who are either married, you're going to be married, you want to be married, you're involved in a relationship with someone. What's the correct answer to, why do you love me? It's not your eyes, it's not your smile, it's not your hair, it's not your breasts, it's not your body, it's not. What's the correct answer? You know, I can't put a finger on it. Why? Because if you can't put a finger on it, it's this. What's going to happen to those eyes, hair, breasts, body, etc. as time goes on. They're not going to look the same as they do now. And if that's what drew you to that person, it's not going to last. Okay? But we by our love so much refined, we know not that ourselves know not what it is. Enter assured of the mind. Assured. What's assurance? No doubt. There's no doubt there. We are inter between assured of the mind. That is, I'm sure what she's thinking, she's sure what I'm thinking. We are thinking the same. We care less eyes, lips, and hands to miss. It doesn't matter if I go away for a weekend or for a week for a business trip. It doesn't matter if I have to go to the continent to do this job. Why? Because our two souls, therefore, which are one, getting to another major, major conceit, our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thin mist feet. Notice, our two souls are like gold. There's a metaphysical conceit. But they're like gold to what? Airy thin mist feet. What kind of metal is gold? Other than expensive. It's malleable. You can pound gold really, really thin. You could literally make a window out of gold. You could pound it thin enough to see through it. It'd have a gold tint to it. But gold doesn't crack. Gold doesn't break. If it's pure, I've got a ring. I don't wear it anymore because I banged the round part on the underside. The, the band isn't made of pure gold. It's a mixture. And it cracks. If it were pure gold, you could hit it with a hammer. It wouldn't crack. It would just bend. Okay? So he says, our souls are like gold. And we do what? We don't separate. If, I, if you stay here and I go there, you just pull it like a rubber band. And then it's almost like between that stanza and the next stanza, the person being addressed kind of gives a look. Like, really? Come on. Okay, new image. If they be two, they are two so as stiff twin compasses are two. And this is why I meant to bring in a geometry compass. Okay? Stiff twin compasses doesn't mean two separate compasses. It means the two legs of a compass. Right? So how does the compass work? Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. So let's say the person being addressed soul is the fixed foot, the black marker. This is the person 
about to go away. So notice, as long as this one stays put, this one doesn't move, right? But this whole thing is the foot. So what happens, imagine you're using a compass, when you do this with the leg. Say so this is the point, this is the pencil. Right? Can you inscribe a circle like that? What do you have to do? This has to be on the same plane as this. So, what's just happened? This one now does what? As this one goes farther and farther and farther away. It leans after it. That's a metaphysical conceit. What is the speaker saying? The farther and farther and farther I go away from you on this trip, what? The more and more and more you bend towards me. And though it, your soul, in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it. Hearkens, calls to. And grows erect as that comes home. Notice, what makes the circle perfect? Perfect circle? No. The fixed foot is what makes the circle perfect. What's meant by the circle? Starting point. Why do we... Most people, not all, wear a ring to symbolize marriage. There's no end. There's no beginning and end on this. Why not? You could wear something that looked like that. Be kind of uncomfortable, I'll admit. But that has what? Joint, joint, joint joint. Those could break. The circle is perfect union. No ending, no beginning. Such wilt thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely, at an angle, run. Thy firmness, you're staying here because what Walton suggests, if I remember correctly, is that she wanted to go with him because of this premonition. Thy firmness makes my circle just, meaning perfect. And it's almost like the speaker saying, if you don't stay here, we won't have a perfect circle anymore. We, something even worse can happen, okay? And makes me end where I begun. So you've got several metaphysical conceits there. Things being um, combined. Okay. Go from there to my last Duchess. Now, that speech by Dunn, it's, it's part of a literary genre. I mean, it's poetry, obviously. It can also be what's called an apostrophe. An apostrophe is when you have somebody speaking... And there's possibly an auditor, a person hearing, but who's just outside the picture, okay? The poem that we're going to read next by uh, Robert Browning, My Last Duchess, is what's called a dramatic monologue. Many people suggest that a poem like Dunn's Valediction for Many Morning is also, is the precursor of a dramatic monologue. You have one speaker in it, and it's pretty clear somebody's being addressed, okay? But in Browning's poem, it's explicitly clear that the person being addressed responds in some way. Doesn't say anything, but the person speaking responds to some action, all right, that the person hearing does. Here's a fantastic little performance. It's on YouTube. Julian Glover uh, is the British actor who does it. Of a guy kind of performing this. It's wonderful. I mean, he, 
He gets everything down here perfectly. Okay? We got a little subtitle, Ferrara. In the 16th century, the Duke of this Italian city arranged to marry a second time after the mysterious death of his very young first wife. Okay? And it's almost like Browning is saying, here's my source material. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive, telling us what? Definitely dead. Page 726. Uh, 910 in the 10th edition. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day. And there she stands. Fra Pandolf is an imaginary painter that he creates. Brown. Okay? I said Fra Pandolf by design. For never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, that depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I. It seemed as they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. So, nope, imagine this ugly bulletin board is the painting. He says, nobody gets to see this unless I pull aside the curtain. And when I do pull aside the curtain, they say what? They say, how? Did that glance on her face come there? But it's almost like she's got this, is it seductive? Not clear, okay? So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Notice, have we heard somebody ask that question? No, we have not. That's their dramatic monologue. There's a, definitely somebody listening and the speaker tells us what that other person is thinking. So he's going to address that question. How'd the glance come there? The look on her face. Twas not her husband's presence only. Now, what does that mean? Who's her husband? Me, the speaker. So he addresses himself in third person. He doesn't say, it wasn't my presence only. Why not? He's created some distance between himself and her. Well, she's obviously dead, so there is distance. But what's he also getting at? That should have been only caused by me, that look on her. Twas not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess's cheek. What's the spot of joy? A little rose tint, a little blush. Like she's, like maybe the painter, Fra Pandolf, has said something. And she's like, oh, Mr. Pandolf. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. Meaning, show me some skin. Pull that mantle up and show me a little bit of your wrist. I think it's safe to assume probably 16th century Italian women didn't show their wrists. Their arms were completely covered. Okay? Or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. As he's painting her, he's describing her in sensual terms. That redness in your throat. Well, why would there be redness? Two reasons. One, again, blush. Two, somebody's you know, throttled her. Well, that hasn't happened. So again, he says something that causes the blood to rush to his skin. Such stuff was courtesy. That is her blushing at these comments. Was courtesy, she thought. Uh, excuse me. The comments... We're, he's just being courteous. And cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad. She was too easily made happy. Too easily impressed. 
She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. And he's going to tell us what that means. So notice, whatever she looked at, she what? She liked it. What does this tell us about her? She doesn't look at anything and go, oh, that's horrible. That's bad. She's innocent. She is completely innocent. She doesn't look at anything and go, oh, there's something going on there. And read some kind of conspiracy. No. Her looks went everywhere. She, uh, excuse me, sir, twas all one. That is, everything brought her joy. What does he mean? My favor at her breast, that's referring to a jewel or gem that she might have like on a brooch or brooch on her gown or on a necklace around her neck. That's the favor, okay? The dropping of the daylight in the west. Who doesn't like a beautiful sunset? She looks at the sunset and goes, wow. The same way she looks at the favor that she wears on her breast. The bow of cherry, some officious fool broke in the orchard for her. Okay. Officious, someone wanting to do her a pleasure. Notice, twas all one. She equates the bowl full of cherries with the beautiful sunset with the gem that she's wearing. Or the white mule she rode with round the terrace. All and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least. Without reading anything else, what's her problem according to the speaker? Or, rephrase that, what's his problem with her? What does he wish she would do? Just with the four examples he gave us. The gym, the sunset, the cherries, riding around on the mule. According to the speaker, which of those should be valued more highly? The thing she's wearing on around her neck. Okay. She thanked men. Good. Why? That's courtesy. That's what you should do. But thank somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. The 900-year-old name? Ferrara, possibly. Okay? What does he mean, the gift of a 900-year-old name? How did he give her that gift? With one of these. She married him. And she took his last name. He's saying that's a gift to her. She equates it with what? around on a white mule, a bowl of cherries. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one and say, just this or that in you disgust me here, here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly self set, her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping. So those lines, who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Who'd stoop? Who'd bow down? Who'd bend over? What does it mean to blame this sort of trifling? To say, honey, you shouldn't do this. I don't like this, I don't like that. Notice what he says. It would be a stooping. Why? What does it mean to stoop? 
I use bend or bow down, okay? What else? If you have to bend or bow down to someone else, and it's not an act of submission, then what is it? What do you think about yourself? You're higher than that person. You have to stoop or bend down. Why? Because you have to reach their level. And what does he say? Even then, to do all those things would be some stooping. And I choose never to stoop. I'm too important. I'm too high and mighty. No, no, no. I'm not going to teach her a lesson. Why? Because that's beneath me. Sir, she smiled, no doubt, whenever I passed her. So I'm walking on along. She turns at me and she smiles. But who passed without much the same smile? In other words, he tells us what about her? She gave the same smile to everybody who walked past her. The boy who works in the stable, the girl who enters the, empties the chamber pots, the woman in the scullery doing the cooking, washing the dishes, they all get the same smile as he does. This grew. What does that mean? What's the this? See, because it's ambiguous. The, the this can be her actions. She didn't stop. Why not? What, what word did I use to describe her before? She's innocent. What else can the this be? This grew his attitude towards what she did. Because his attitude's already clear, isn't it? He doesn't stoop. Why? He's more important. This grew. This sense of importance grew. This being upset with her behavior grew. I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. Why? We're not told what the commands were. We do know she stopped smiling. There she stands as if alive. What happens between the commands and there she stands as if alive? She's no longer alive. He hasn't come out and boldly admitted, I had her killed. But that is the clear meaning. There she stands as if alive. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the count, your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his daughter's, his fair daughter's self, as I vowed at starting, is my object. Ah, now we get information about why the other person is there. What's about to happen? The count, his fair daughter's self, dowry, They're going to enter into a negotiation for a new wife, the Count's daughter. Okay? So he says, let's go down. That's the, re, you know, will you please rise? Since they've been sitting looking at a picture, now they're going to get up and go down together. Notice what comes right after, as I have out at starting, is my object. What's the very next word? Nay. Why? The person listening starts to get up and go first. Why? I gotta warn my master. This guy's psychotic. He's gonna kill his daughter if she what? Doesn't please him specially. Okay? 
And he does what? As they continue their way down the stairs. Oh yeah, that right there? Neptune, struck by Klaus of Innsbruck. What does this guy want his dead wife to have been, ultimately, and his possible new wife to have been? And I know it's 855. What are the two things he's mentioned? This painting and what? This sculpture. He wants his wives to be what? Works of art that are there to do one thing, to please him. He doesn't want living, breathing women or wives. Okay, we'll stop there. Did not get nearly as far as I wanted to, so we'll just plow on along. Everything that's on the syllabus, whether we discuss it or not, will be on quizzes and or um, the final exam.